since I've been promoting from the from this very chair for like the last month. So is that your promoting spot now? It's my new promoting seat. <laughs> Everyone on my team is like, you need a new room in the house. Everyone's seen your living room. <laughs> So talking about the new single though, how has that been putting it out and getting the fan responses for this? It's been great. I mean, you know, uh, we were ready to put this out over a year ago. We were, you know, this album was finished in the beginning of 2020 and, um, you know, we, we were ready to put it out and, uh, obviously the world was coming to an end. So we had to sort of sit on it, but, um, you know, it was, when I got the call, like, hey, we're ready to go, let's do this, we kind of knew right away Kiss the World Goodbye would be a good, like, head, you know, good leading single. It just mm -hmm. felt like very representative of the times. It felt like a, uh, a song that was written during the pandemic, even though eerily it was written just before, so it had nothing to do with a pandemic. Um, but it, it still felt like it was the right song, and uh, the response has been great. I mean, everyone seems really stoked on it, and the video came out great, and, um, so yeah, I'm, I couldn't be happier. So you made the song before the pandemic, but was the video filmed during the pandemic? The video was filmed. So we, the, the, the song was recorded, written and recorded before the pandemic. And then mm -hmm. we waited and waited and went. And then once we got the call, there was like a month and a half, two month window where LA was like off of lockdown and yeah. everybody could go out and shh make movies and make TV and do things without their masks on. That's mm -hmm. when we shot. So we had like a small window. And now we're like worried about if we want to do a second music video or shoot a second single that we're mm -hmm. not going to have an opportunity to do that. Actually, my yours video, which I released at the end of 20 or beginning of 2020, mm -hmm. that we shot that literally and finished it the day before we went into lockdown. So wow, yeah, I've been like, just really squeezing it in the last year. <laughs> Finding the perfect windows to film That's all right. this stuff. That's right. So where did the information, uh, inspiration for this specific music video come from? Where did the, inf oh, inspiration. The inspiration. Yeah, yeah. I think um, for, for this video, it was, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to do some kind of like Bonnie and Clyde. You know, the song mm -hmm. has this sort of us against the world feel to it. And, uh, we had just, I had just watched Bonnie and Clyde, like the older, I think it was like 1950s or 60s edition with uh, Faye Dunaway and uh, blanking on his name. Uh, uh, it's Warren anyway. Beatty. Is Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty? Thank, thank you, Warren Beatty, yeah. So, um, and I kind of, I like, it just was such a cool uh, visual and I felt like it really matched the song. So we kind of did a modern day Bonnie and Clyde where, mm -hmm we knew we would have this moment where we were down on our times and we had to do something drastic to sort of save our family. And I think that was a story, it's a story as old as time. I feel like people yeah. can really get behind, you know, doing anything really, if it means you're gonna protect or take care of your family. So uh, we worked with two incredible music video directors, Max and Madison, who uh, are actually a brother and sister duo and uh and they filmed this whole thing um and did such a fantastic job we did the whole video in just a day which is incredible when you look at it um and uh but yeah so that was the inspiration and um i think we really executed it well yeah for to have that whole thing done in a whole day that's pretty impressive yeah it's like a mini movie yeah it really it felt like it and uh it was boiling. It was like 97 degrees the day that we were shooting out in the middle of Palmdale, California in the desert. And uh, we managed to get it done. Dang. Um, it's been a while since you released a full length album, seven years. So what made now the perfect time to release in your opinion? I was just done writing. Like I had been writing for I don't know, a couple of years at that point. And I, I feel like I had said everything I wanted to say. And um, I don't really rush projects, as you can tell. Seven years is like an eternity in pop music. But I just feel like, um, and I've said this before, but I feel like the, the stories that are written on albums happen in the in-between time, right? So mm -hmm. you need those years to go by. You need life to happen to be able to 
right, you know? And so I was really just kind of enjoying my life, to be honest with you, just my best, you know, trying my best to enjoy the new relationship that I was in, the, you know, the big move, I, you know, moving in with somebody, having it, getting a house and traveling quite a bit and just all those things have to happen, I feel like, in order to write something meaningful and something that is going to be um, relatable. And, uh, you know, this, this album in general, I think, touches a lot on sort of my relationship with Katie and mm -hmm. the ups and downs of a music career as a young teenager and then growing into my 20s and now 30s. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very good, rep, you know, it's a reflective uh, take on, on sort of my life. And um, yeah, I think uh, hopefully it won't be another seven years, though, for the next one. <laughs> I think it's a little too long. Just a little bit, yeah. I would have to agree. But when you released your last album, was that a conscious decision that you made once it was out and you were done touring that? Were you like, I'm going to take a step back? Um, I don't know that it was conscious. I think it was just, uh, I, you know, I also did other things. I was on a TV show for a couple seasons. Um, I wanted to do more, explore more acting projects. Mm -hmm. Uh I tried my hand at writing some of my own television projects and, you know, there were some other things I just wanted to do. And, um, you know, as a, as an artist, I think people obviously know me most, mostly for my singing and songwriting, but I think, you know, I do a lot of other stuff too. And so it's, it's hard to do all of it at once and keep, yeah. you know, it's hard to keep the musical boat floating when there's like 15 other projects that are, you know, that you've been, trying to that are kind of sinking that you're like okay i need to i need to focus more on these things so um no i don't think it was conscious i think i just was doing other stuff and really just having too much fun with my life <laughs> but your life obviously has made you a better songwriter would you say yeah totally i mean like i said anything that um that anything you can pull from real life inspiration and i feel like as you get older too you're you're just naturally a wiser person you've lived longer you know more things um you have you have been in more relationships you know with romantic or otherwise you know and and mm -hmm. i think that allows you to just be able to pull from a deeper well to go back to when you were just a singer was there a conscious or something that happened to where you had a life experience and you were like this would make a great song that made you want to dip into songwriting or was it being a singer, seeing all these songwriters and producers around you maybe that inspired you? Do you remember writing your first song? The first song I wrote, I think was She's No You with uh, two writers by the name of Matthew Gerard and, man, this is gonna be hard. Um, I can't think of the other gentleman's name and I feel terrible. Uh, hopefully he's not watching, I don't think he is. <laughs> Oh, the hill. Um, Aaron something. Anyway, I was 16. And mm -hmm. before that, I had written a lot of crummy, like really not so good songs. And I feel like I needed that co-writing experience and collaborating, you know, that collaborative effort to, to really understand how a song is written. And, yeah. but I knew I wanted to do it. And I felt like as long as I was making my own album, I might as well be a part of it. And, uh, you know, in a creative way, mm -hmm. other than just singing. And that's kind of when I got the bug. I feel like She's No You and I wrote this song. She's No You is so, when you, when you listen to that song, it's, it's, such a, it's such a tribute to the songs that I was clearly listening to at that time, which is like Craig David, Daniel Bedingfield. Um, uh, who else? Just maybe even John Mayer. Like, I, mainly Craig David, to be honest with you. The Born to Do It album, I feel like I was just cycling that album over and over before going into the Beautiful Soul album. So you can hear it in that writing. And, and um, I just kind of learned from, from, from working with those guys, just how to format a song and, you know, how to, you know, how to arc a storyline and how to start here and then end here and what the bridge means and what you want to do there and how you need to, a, a musical change here and, and obviously the evolution of pop music in general has changed so much, you know, and being, I've been a part of that on the front lines now for over 15 years. But, um, 
but I, I do remember that first moment of being in the studio and definitely feel, feeling intimidated because I'd never written a song before. Mm -hmm. But the guys were like, were just super cool and made me feel like, hey, let's hear your ideas, you know? And I think, I think when you go into any writing room, you have to be, like a lot of times in LA, I'll walk into writing rooms with people I've never met before and we'll sit down, we've never met, I don't even know their last name and we'll write the most intimate song you could imagine. And I think that's just kind of like a songwriter thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like a, hey, we're here to work and let's do something great. Let's put our shit aside and just like do something great, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Do you find a different sense of accomplishment or emotions when you release a song that you know that you wrote compared to one song that you didn't? Sure. I mean, you take pride in your work like anything else, mm -hmm. you know? And so when you write a great song and you, and you know it's good. And then of course, when it connects, that's like the ultimate, you know, when it really connects or becomes a hit song, that's yeah. like, that's like a different level of euphoria, but um, because it came from your brain, you know, nobody knew this mm -hmm. information until you decided it was going to be, it was going to exist, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, um, it definitely, uh, it's, it's definitely a prideful moment. Um, and of course, look, I, I totally love and, and I enjoy singing uh, songs that I've never written. I, I did a, a stint on The Masked Singer on season three and we, I basically sang a bunch of songs that I've never written. Mm -hmm. And there's, you, I take a lot of joy in singing great music too. If the song is good, another writer can appreciate a good song and also mm -hmm. want to sing a great song. But it's definitely a little extra special when you've written it. So once a song is out and then you start to think about your tour, do you have specific thoughts in mind when you're creating that you're going to be like, oh, this would be great if I match this with maybe this song or how do you lay it out? You mean on stage? Yeah. So when you're putting together a stage show, you know, there's a number of things that go into play. And obviously, actually, I'm doing that as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think... Uh, are, you, are you talking about, like, creatively lights and stuff, what that looks like with each song? Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, obviously the first thing, at least for me, I mean, a lot of artists change their set list every, you know, in the middle of the tour. I like a really polished tour. So I, I go in with the set list I'm going to play for 22 or 24 shows. Like that's, mm -hmm. and that's what I play the whole time. And very rarely do I change it unless something's just not working, which does happen in the first few shows. But by the third or fourth show, I feel like I've got my, sh my set list tweaked and like dialed in. And it takes weeks, if not months, of prep before. So I'm already mm -hmm. prepping now and started in June, to, to be honest with you, for my tour in November. And that's just like dialing in all of the new music, stripping down all the, you know, parts and the tracks that I don't need so that my musicians on stage can play them instead. Mm -hmm. So taking out certain drum sounds, taking out, taking out guitar sounds, perhaps adding certain things, right? So uh, mm -hmm. maybe I love the sound of a song on the album, but I, I feel like live, it needs a little extra something. So I'll go in and I'll record more vocals, live vocals for the background tracks so that it has a more live presence. Um, and then when you get into lighting, I'll sit down for a couple weeks with my lighting guy and we'll go over what song or what temperature of light feels good mm -hmm. for each song. So for Kiss the World Goodbye, we'll probably have you know, deep reds and, and, and romantic, you know, colors, you know, dark yellows and, and deep oranges and reds. But then for, for songs like Leave In, right? Like some of the hit songs, we'll keep it really icy cold and do bright whites and blues and really clean lines. Um, so you go over all that stuff and you can literally just go insane trying to make it perfect. But I, mm -hmm. do, my very, I do my very best. And honestly, like there's one thing I take a lot of pride in, it's my live show. I feel like it's one of my strongest cards that I hold uh -huh. and I always have the best musicians on stage and um and you know and I try to take them on a journey I think for you know for lack of a better term I, I think that like it's uh for me you know you want to bring the audience up and then you want to bring them down and then you want to bring them up and then you want to bring them down so you try to throw as many up tempos and ballads back to back so that you're kind of doing this the whole time you know yeah. And you, you can feel the wave when it's happening. And then when you feel like a little like, mm, they're not really feeling this right now, maybe it's literally because it was after the wrong song. You know, maybe it was just mm -hmm. like, oh, that just doesn't fit there. Or maybe they just don't like that song. <laughs> and then you don't play it again. 
but um but yeah so that's kind of how it works is there a specific song from this new album that you're excited to play live well yeah i mean i'm you know the new single i'm just excited to to hear it's the one song everyone knows right now so mm -hmm. uh you know i think it's the one that they'll be most familiar with so you know getting to hear people sing a new song and know all the words for the very first time is a very special moment mm -hmm. how would you sum up this new album if you could in a couple words or sentences i would say it's um hopelessly romantic and uh um uncharacteristically vulnerable mm -hmm. In just a couple words, that that's how I'd sum it up. If you want a longer description, I can give you the the lengthier version. <laughs> I would so say, we, uh, if there's one thing that like I'm not super good at in real life, it's just sort of letting my guard down. Um, I like to make jokes out of everything, but when it mm -hmm. comes to music, uh, I think that's my one space where I can kind of, kind of get kind you know real and honest for mm -hmm. a minute. So I think this album does that, and I think you hear a lot of honesty. Um, whether it's ugly or not, it's just honest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's a lot of that as well. But you know, certainly, I think the the relationship that I, I'm in played a big role in, in writing this one. So it's an open book into where you've been. Basically, an open book, Jessica. I'm an open <laughs> book. I love that, though. I mean, I feel like that's those are the best songs because I people so. can relate to them. I, I mean, so. I think so. you're not faking it. It's just truth. I think so. I was listening to uh, John Mayer's new album yesterday again for like the sixth time. And uh, he's got a song on there that I just think is so, it like made me, like I was driving in the car and I was just like, man, this is so, it's funny because he's similar in that he's like, he's kind of, there's something very hard about him. But then like, as soon as you tap the shell or, you know, get, the, you find the crack in the shell, He's like this open book. There's a song he's got called uh, um, Till the Right One Comes. I don't know if you've heard the new album. Yes. But it's sort of like, I think it's like, a, it's a song about how he, and now we're talking about John Mayer for some reason, but he um, talks about just like how people project all of their thoughts about how he's just sitting around waiting to find somebody and then he does, or, you know, but he's waiting till he does. He's waiting for the right one to come. Just a great song, but it's a great you know, I, th I feel like I have some of that as well on this album where it's just very vulnerable and you get an inside look as to what's tumbling around in my head, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Listening to popular music, do you get a little bit of inspiration from other artists? Um, usually older artists, but, uh, but sometimes, I mean, sometimes if somebody's done something very, very well, you know, I'll be like, wow, I want to do something similar to that. You know, mm -hmm. I love that sound that he was going for and those pianos or those, I love those synth sounds. Um, like I remember when Stranger Things first came out, there's the instrument that's playing those, that, that intro music that mm -hmm. it's called a Juno and it's a very famous synthesizer. And I just remember thinking like, I want to use that on a song. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went into the studio. I don't know if it ever, that song ever went anywhere, but you know, it happens all the time where you'll hear something, you know, sometimes I'll hear like the overtone of something like, I know this sounds funny, but like just the sound of like a slot machine in Vegas, uh -huh. like you'll hear a certain thing that goes off in the machine and it's like, and it keeps repeating and you're like, damn, that kind of sounds like a, a vibe. You know what I mean? And it's like, and it's just a slot machine going and I'll like put my phone up to it and I'll be like, I'm just, <laughs> people are like, sir, put your phone away. We're in Las Vegas, you can't have your phone yeah. out. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This is art. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it catches you when you least expect it and it happens at the most inconvenient time sometimes. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, that's, that's part of the fun in it. It's just being prepared at mm -hmm. all times for, for something cool to hit you in the face. That's awesome. Okay, now we're going to go into the Q and A portion. Q and A. That's someone the asked what's your favorite. Huh? Nothing it was a bad joke. What's your favorite Dream Street song? My favorite Dream Street song. Hold on, I want to do something funny. 
<laughs> my favorite Dream Street song is, uh, I'd probably have to say, uh, Gotta Get the Girl. You know, that was like my first solo song. So that was like the I only solo song I had. I have to give my roommate a shout out as well because she loves Dream Treat. Still listens to it today. Puts what's it on your, blast in the apartment. What's your roommate's name? Jen. Hey, Jen. <laughs> shout yeah, out she, to Jen. She's in the chat right now, too. <laughs> hey, Jen. Oh. Sorry. I'm what's your favorite to... color? Uh, orange. Always has been. Is there a specific reason or no? I just like, I just like its hue. Someone has how do singers? On the spectrum, it's a good combination of red and yellow. It's just it's right in the middle. Red's mm -hmm. a little too red, and yellow's too yellow. I want something just right down the middle. Perfect combination. Yeah. Someone asked, how do singers sing a very emotional song without crying? How do how do singers do it? Yeah. I think <laughs> I think when you're singing, uh, it's actually a pretty good question because I've I've been. Uh, I've been choked up by singing a song here and there, like a certain moment in my life that caught me off guard and like I've caught myself singing, but it's very rare. I think when you're singing it, you have your, you're in the middle of a job that you're trying mm -hmm. to accomplish and you're, you're focusing so much on your, your performance, your notes and like the movement of, of the melody that you're, you're trying to make people cry usually, or you're trying to, you're trying to land an emotion on people that you're, mm -hmm. you're doing too much. You're one side of the brain is doing too much thinking to, to, uh, to actually get teared up while you're singing it. But it does happen. I mean, if you look at like, this is a really sad example, but if you try to like s sing at like a funeral or something, right. Mm -hmm. I guess like, you know, it's a terrible time. And if that song reminds you of a certain place in your life, I could see why people, but Generally, uh, yeah, but I've been in the audience and I've watched artists sing and I've gotten chills for sure, or been totally, you know, choked up. Do you get even more choked up when you see your fans reacting to your songs? Yeah, I think I get really emotional when I feel, when I hear or see, you know, I hear a story of a fan that went through something, you know, tragic or, you know, mm -hmm. just, really hard in their life and uh there's a song that like really connected with them mm -hmm. and i know the story and then they see them react to it in the audience or uh you know when i hear about a certain thing that happened and they use the album to, to cope it, that really gets me you know and it's yeah. like really like really and it's um it's really nice to be able to do that for people and mm -hmm. uh it definitely can get the better of me sometimes, so. Speaking of your fans, did they know that you were the turtle? The, the diehard ones, for sure. I think all the, uh, all the people who've been following me for many years knew, uh, you know, knew who was singing behind the mask because I have a pretty distinct voice and also distinct mannerisms. I think I, my, mm -hmm. the way I move on stage is, is pretty unique to me. So, um, yeah. And my mother, of course, emailed me after the week one and she's like, I can't believe you didn't tell me you're on the show. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? She's like, don't, you can't lie to me. I know. I, yeah. yeah. I burst. You weren't allowed to tell anyone though? Like, no. I didn't tell anybody. The only person that knew was Katie because she saw me leaving the house every morning mm -hmm. in like, in like a mask and a, and a hoodie. Uh, and she's like, what is going on here? Yeah. So we have, but we both had to sign non-disclosure agreements that we wouldn't tell anybody. And I didn't, I didn't tell anybody. I mean, my family eventually figured it out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's your family. They're going to know. Yeah. But, um, you know, my secret was safe because they couldn't, you know, they knew it was a, a, a secretive show, but the mm -hmm. fans knew. I mean, I, I would go on, you know, online on Instagram and YouTube and check it out. And after week two, I think it was a lock. People for sure knew. Yeah. Especially after like certain clues came out, we totally. were like, for sure, that's Justin McCartney. There's totally, no yeah. Um, someone asked, "Do you have a favorite song to perform from back in the day?" Um, I love Body Language. 
to me that's like with T-Pain like that's such a fun song and uh recording that song was during like a really fun period of my life and mm -hmm. uh so every time I play it it brings me back to working with T-Pain in the studio and it's such an undeniable up-tempo bop you know like when you hear that song everyone is just hyped in the audience and sings along and if you ever need an up-tempo song to, to jam into the set, it's body language. Is that the song that gets the most reactions, would you say? Uh, it's maybe no. No, I mean, certainly not more than Leave In or Beautiful Soul, of course, uh -huh. um, or even She's No You, but but maybe she, maybe more than She's I mean, it's up there. It's definitely among, like, a staple in my catalog, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you, Jessica. It was great speaking was with great. you. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for the album. Thank you so much. Me too. And thank you for giving us so many, sh so many bangers. Aw. Like, well, listen. you have to. You'll have to come to my show. I'm playing at the Wiltern at the end of uh, sometime in December, I think, early December. It's my last show of the tour. Well, yeah. To close out, I mean. You gotta come check it out. It's gonna be a good one. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jessica. Be safe thank and you. try to get outside and enjoy the day. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a work day, so, oh. you know. <laughs> I think you can take off early today. I said so. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll tell my boss. I'll okay. make sure you mention it. Okay, good. Take care, Jessica. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.